United Nations Appeal for Children meets with an impressive response in Dunedin. Assembling at the Oval, 3,000 primary school children prepare for a parade through the city. Banners designed and made by the pupils themselves bring to mind the needs of ailing and hungry children in war-ravaged countries. No Dunedin parade is complete without its pipe band and from the octagon the Prime Minister watches the procession. Dunedin's children have set an example for other New Zealand cities to give a day and save a child. Exceptionally heavy rain accompanied by a raging gale causes East Coast rivers to rise nearly 40 feet above normal level, creating the worst floods in local history. High tides and heavy seas bank up the waters and pile debris on the foreshore. Damage to property was heavy, communications were disrupted and many families had terrifying times as the flood water rose and swept everything before it. household furniture and property was lost, and over 12,000 head of stock are estimated to have perished. Many were swept out to sea at the peak of the storm, and as the waters recede, grim evidence of the destruction remains, tangled and heaped against fences. Voluntary relief organizations were at work in the stricken areas, and the government is already restoring communications, assessing the damage and bringing relief. Victoria University College students liven up the capital city with their annual Capping Day procession. A buxom sweater girl leads a precariously articulated monster. Scientific investigation is given considerable attention and other enlightening slogans give cause for thought. At least one float commands a clear passage through the crowds. Transportation is given the works and Victoria also shows that not only Dunedin can reenact the pioneer landings, Towards the end, some of the participants begin to show signs of wear and tear, but the procession leaves onlookers with some topical subject to ponder over. The road from Nelson to the west coast winds and climbs through snow-covered ranges that rise across the middle of the Nelson province. A turn in the road and below lies a great glacial valley through which flows the Cobb River, 2,500 feet above sea level and the main source of Nelson's electric power. At present, the cob is harnessed by two storage dams and the water is diverted along a tunnel cut through the hillside and then piped down to the powerhouse below. 12,000 kilowatts are fed from the powerhouse to every part of Nelson province. It's the weight of water falling through these pipes which produces the electricity. Over in the valley, an earth dam stores the water. It's only 30 feet high and there are plans to build a new dam 100 feet high that will greatly increase the power output of the Cobb scheme. Task now is to cut a diversion tunnel before the dam itself can be built. And at the weekly meeting of the Production Council, 
The engineer in charge at Cobb outlines work for the coming week to his fellow engineers and the workers who will do the job. Everyone sits down together, problems are thrashed out, and as a result, the job goes a lot more smoothly. The shifts are due to change, and some of the men who are working on the diversion tunnel prepare to go below. The lift drops them 70 feet down a shaft to the diversion tunnel. The men face another eight hours of work beneath the surface. There's water underfoot, the atmosphere's damp, and there's no fresh air. After hours of drilling, a small truckload of rubble comes to the surface and is emptied into the tumbling Cobb River. Shovels and dredges clear away the snow-covered earth, making ready the site for the new dam. On completion of the project, the Cobb River will produce another 20,000 kilowatts of electricity. More power for the South Island, because engineers have planned and workers are bringing these plans to reality. Mm -hmm.